download you version? If you have not downloaded it, it will Look, not work. download the Bible app. It's not on your phone automatically if you're a Christian. I'm sorry. It should be. All right. And then go to, in the search, go to Ferris Hill Baptist Church, or Ferris Hill Baptist Youth, and it's going to come up with a, uh, a live event, much like that. All right? And then it's going to have a question on there, uh, a poll question. So, hey, Jay. Uh, is you first in the Bible? Bible? Don't look for it now if you don't have it downloaded. Like, yeah, it's the Bible. Bible. All right. Got it? Okay. Like, Ready? We're going to get started. Oh, uh, one second. My phone's oh. stupid. It's slow. Bro. No, we're not going to wait for you. All right. Who can tell me what a breath is? I can't. Someone who disobeys. Oh, no, somebody who goes against control, authority, or tradition. All right. Anybody? Control, authority, or tradition. All right. We've got ten minutes. We're going to get through this. Right. All right. Anybody that goes against control, authority, or tradition. And so tonight we're going to be talking about how Jesus was a rebel because Jesus would turn people away on purpose. If uh, you think about po politics these days, people are in, in politics and they're and they're uh, and they're trying to get a lot of people to vote for them. Would it make sense for have the people get turned away on purpose? To be turned off on purpose? You go to a political rally and then we have. Uh, all of a sudden, the guy's up there telling racist jokes and making fun of your haircut and all that stuff, and people are like, man, this guy's a jerk, and then you walk away because you're like, you don't like him. That, would be, that wouldn't make any sense in today's politics. But today we're going to talk about how Jesus would turn people away on purpose, and that doesn't make a lot of sense to us either because it goes against world cultures. Who can tell me who JFK was? John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy. He announced that he was running for president. He was elected in 19, November 8th of 1960 for president. Who can tell me when, who, who knows when he uh, announced that he was running for president? Well, I'm not sure. The year he January 2nd, 1960. So less than 11 months before he was running for, before he was elected, he decided to run for election, or made, uh, made the announcement that he was running for election. Okay, uh, Barack Obama. He was elected president in 2004, 2008, I'm sorry, 2008. When did he make the announcement that he was uh, running for president? February 10th, 2007. So JFK announced 11 months before he was running for president, or before he was elected. Uh, Barack Obama announced 23 months before he was elected. So he had, his election campaign was two years long, and... Uh, and uh, JFK's election was only one year long. So, what's the deal? What's the purpose of a campaign? What's the idea? What do you want to people to do? To make people know about you. To make people know about you? What else? To get liked. To be liked. So, if, uh, if let's say, um, a lot of people know who Charlie Manson is, but a lot of people don't like Charlie Manson. So, it wouldn't help you to get to people to know about you if they didn't like you. So the goal is to get people to like you, get you enough, like you enough to make you vote for you. So if you're going to have a candidacy or a campaign, it's going to, if it's going to last two years, you stop running out of things to say. You stop running, or you have, stop having things to say, and you start having to do things. Uh, I, I've run out of good things to say about myself, so I'm going to have to start saying bad things about other people. So your candidacy is uh, is designed to either get people to know about you, like you enough that they can vote for you or to know about you and dislike your opponent enough that they won't vote for you, or they won't vote for him. So, this is a poll question on your version and live event thing. You'll see a question, if you didn't know anything about a politician's views, whether he believed in abortion, gay marriage, uh, First Amendment rights, anything, he wants to raise all of your taxes for 100%, if you didn't know anything about your politician, uh, which of these would be would say the most to you? His appearance, his smile, his good sense of humor, or their ability to work a crowd? You know, when I say ability to work a crowd, I mean getting around and getting to know everybody and, and saying one or two really good things to somebody and then moving on. The ability to talk to the entire group at the same time. And then the question is, how did Jesus work the crowd? Jesus didn't work the crowd the same way a politician would. Uh, Jesus rebelled against the culture because whether you believe that Jesus came to, uh, to, to clean up Judaism and bring it back and reform it, 
Or if you think that Jesus came to establish a new religion called Christianity, uh, it doesn't matter. Jesus would work a large crowd differently than what modern politicians would do. He spoke in difficult to understand parables. He turned people off on purpose. He asked them to do extremely difficult and painful things. Uh, and he, he just was constantly, every time a large crowd gathered around him, he constantly tried to whittle them down into a small group of people. But imagine if you will Mitt Romney or Barack Obama in front of 10,000 people and saying something like, you must hate your mom, your dad, your sisters, your brothers, and your own children before you can vote for me. Get yourself an electric chair, plug yourself into it, and every day, and then vote for me. If you're not willing to do that, go find another candidate. Can you imagine a politician saying that today? That's pretty much exactly what Jesus said. Now, we have two passages of Scripture tonight that illustrate clearly that Jesus is insisting that his followers take the harder, more painful road. And today's politicians always try to make their way the easiest. I'm not going to raise taxes. Your, your opponent's going to raise taxes. My opponent's going to raise taxes. I'm going to make you get, have more money in your pocket. Your opponent's going to take money from your pocket. They always try to make it the, uh, the other way. It's extremely hard. So Luke 14, 25-33. Again, if you've got the U version app, it's right there on the uh, live event. Um, it says, Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned to them and said. So here we had Jesus confronted by a large crowd. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned to them and said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yet even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So the cross was a form of public execution, much today like the um, lethal injection, the electric chair. It says you must take up your public display of execution and, and follow me. Take it up every day. Kill yourself every day. You must hate your mom, your dad, your brothers and sisters. It says these are, these are extremely hard things uh, for anybody to do. And then Jesus was asking his entire disciples, all of them that came up to him and wanted to follow him, he says, Unless you're willing to hate your mom, your dad, your brothers, your sisters, your children, unless you're willing to die every single day, don't even worry about coming and following me. So there we have the first passage. Then we got the second passage. In this passage, it's extremely long. John 6, 1 through 69. Uh, but we're only going to hit a couple verses here. Uh, 26 through 69. But Jesus had just fed 5,000 people. That's 5,000 men. And then you got the women and the children there along because for some reason they just counted the men. But then you got, you got upwards of ten to 15,000 people Jesus had just fed with basically uh, a take-home bag or take, uh, you know, like a doggy bag from David's Capital house. And he's got a couple pieces of bread, a couple pieces of fish, and he feeds all these people. And then afterwards, these people want to make Jesus into a king. So he just kind of excludes himself. He talks to his disciples. They get in a boat. They cross over the sea going to Capernaum. And Jesus goes up the mountain to pray by himself. And then some people get in the boat and they start following the disciples. And then Jesus comes out and he walks on the water and he gets, meets his, his disciples halfway in the boat. They see it's him, they get freaked out. They, uh, they, uh, wouldn't you all be freaked out if you saw a guy walking on water? So they let Jesus back in the boat and as soon as Jesus gets on the boat, immediately they're in Capernaum. And then the next day, some of the people that were there getting fed the food, uh, they see Jesus and they're like, wait a minute, 11 people got in the boat. There's Jesus. No other boats came. How did he get here? And they asked that question. They asked Jesus, Rabbi, how did you get here? And Jesus was never one to satisfy curiosity. And in John 6, 26 to 69, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life. He was saying, you don't care about me. All you care about is you thought I was your meal ticket. You thought I was the one that was going to get you some grub, and you would never have to work again because I was going to give you good food every single day. You uh, did which the Son of Man will give to you. For on, for on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God that you believe in him who has he, whom he has sent. So they said to him, Then what signs do you... Uh, do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the man in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, 
It was not Moses who gave you bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall no, not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should do, lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on that last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So the Jews grumbled about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he not now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the, in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God, he has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate from the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that, any, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Then the Jews disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, This is where it gets good. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. For my flesh is true blood, and my blood is true drink. How many of y'all, if you're looking for a religious leader to follow, you showed up at church on Sunday morning, and Pastor Brian says, you need to eat my flesh, you need to drink my blood if you want to get into heaven. And that's what Jesus said. First he said, you must hate your father, your mother, your brothers, your sisters, your own children. You must take up a form of execution and carry it around you like a badge of honor. Be willing to die every day. You must eat my flesh and drink my blood if you want to be a follower of me. So, what in the world does this have to do with him? Too many times today, you're going to hear Christians, you're going to hear preachers say, if you want to believe in Jesus, if you believe in Jesus, everything's going to come good. You're going to have a nice car, a nice house, you're going to be not sick, your children are going to be wonderful, you're going to eat good food all the time. That's not true. The truth is what Jesus said here. If you follow me, you're going to run through hard times. You're going to, you might be killed, you might lose everything, you might lose the creature comforts we have in America, you might have to go live in a foreign country where they don't have air conditioning, clean water, good food. You might be persecuted, people might make fun of you, you might lose friends, you might lose family. Are you willing to give that up in order to, to follow Christ? You're going to have preachers say, follow Christ and everything's going to turn out good, but you have Jesus says, you follow me and things might turn ugly. And you have to decide, what am I going to do? Sometimes following Christ can be very uncomfortable. And it's going to be a rebellion on your part because following Christ in your high schools and your colleges and your public schools and friends, it's not going to be easy. And they might make fun of you. You might be asked to do uncomfortable things. So I encourage you. My, my goal for this week is for each one of you to come back. Remember, how many of you are VBS this week? They had the Strongman Challenge. And they had somebody come up every day. And they would, they would say how, how they, they did something for Jesus, how they, they believed in Jesus. And it takes a lot of courage and a lot of strength to stand up on stage and look at your peers and say that you did something for God. I want to be, have you all come back here next Wednesday during the Youth VBS and have, take the Strong Man Challenge or the Strong Woman Challenge and say, this is what I did for God this week. I fasted. I did not look at Facebook or Twitter or my phone all week. I, uh, I read my Bible. I read the whole book of John in one sitting. It took me two hours, but I read the whole book. Or I shared my faith with somebody. Or I gave food to a homeless man. Anything that you do that, that takes you out of your comfort zone, that makes you feel a little bit, this is hard. This goes against what I, what I normally would do. I want to hear about that. I want you to come back and I want you to tell the whole group about that. Because I want to be, I want to be encouraged by what you're doing for God. So, let's pray. Father, we love you, and we thank you for all the blessings that you've given us, and we just ask you to help us to be strong men and strong women, and help us to not fall for the line that following you is going to be an easy path. When, we, when it gets hard, then we turn away from you. 
but help us to embrace the struggle. And I just ask you to bless this, in Jesus' name.